this land is a special place this land who has an average They just cannot come here and just rape and pillage our home. Because we don't have much here. And we, we're battling now to survive about, you know, how we can cope with all this, uh, uh, especially with our government that we have. That, uh, we not recognize race or people still yet. And uh, I think they just want to delete every Aborigine from Australia, because we are a pest to uh, to uh, the government society. Ngai ngai ko ni kaina lestanya ka ngai ko ngora ano ng bitin jara yan ko jara manda ngai ulbulgar ng mimilila. My name is Karina Lester. I'm from Mimili community on the ano ng bitin jara yan ko jara lands APY lands. Um, and I'm here to talk about the concern or issue that we are faced with in South Australia um, of the federal government pushing for a national waste storage facility. Wapriata is can hopperlin. You're a wooden yanang operator in Wigaman then. My name is Vince Coulthard, I'm an agent and person from the Flinders Ranges uh, area of South Australia. Um, I am um, also the Chief Executive Officer for the Agent and Traditional Lands Association. People come to our country to spoil it, but we respect it. And I would say that every Aboriginal person across this whole country feels the same way as I do for my country. Tests were done in South Australia back in the 50s, in the 1950s. Um, EMU tests was the location in October 1953 um, where the British came to do their first tests. That was the first test done that took my father's sight um, in that dad and, and the wider community were impacted by um, that first test of, at EMU Fields. So later then, over time, in the 50s and 60s, many, many tests were conducted at Maralinga, um, and Maralinga people have been largely impacted by those tests as well. So um, we have a story, we have a history, and the history is that Arnongo have been moved, relocated because of British tests, because of governments of the day, wanting to have access to land, wanting to experiment and test on Arnongal country, on Aboriginal land. I was born in 1953, uh, which is the same time as Emu, uh, Maralinga lands were bombed, uh, testing. It's a wonder that the waste, I uh, wonder the smoke didn't affect me as a child because I was born at Lee Creek uh, in the old township and mum and dad said that when I was born on 8th of March 1953 there was a big smog across the Flinders Ranges and it could be the smoke from Maralinga lands. We still suffer from the remains I guess, the, the the mess that the British left here in the early 50s with the testing of Maralinga. And quite a number of years ago I went out there to, to some of those test sites and you know, even though there's 40 odd years down the track, it's still evident. The, that meter still clicks away.
I think a lot of people should see what happened with Maralinga. Um, and we don't want this anymore. I mean, it's the reason why these people have been taken away from the area was because of this. And now they want to show it back in their faces again. And um, we are going to put up a fight to, um, to not have this done to us the second time. This artwork behind me here now I've done from the ladies from Yamata, uh, telling their stories. Uh, they've got it down in artwork to my sculpture. Uh, I worked in collaboration with another sculptor, a chap by the name of John Turpy. Uh, we put together the sculpture and we took it across to Japan and um, it was something that we um, were honoured to take to Nagasaki. When people come witness what what we're sort of presenting here, it's going to add some weight to, uh, to the cause, to the fight, to not let these people, you know, make decisions without consultation with the traditional owners. What happened back in the 1950s, there was no consultation. We were just told to pack up and go. And uh, Ngopala uh, parents come from this country, and like uh, my grandmama, uh, my granddads, and they lived here, uh, Wanderwicha. And uh, you know, they had a very uh, wonder, beautiful life, and, uh, but then uh, things started to change and they put them on the back foot. And that's why today you have any, you know, Vedic in. Uh, in Mabana now, they live. The ceremony stopped in the Flinders Ranges in 1947, 48. But there was about 30 of Adnamatna men went through to the northwest, including myself. And we went through tribal law in the northwest because we missed out here. Uh, we wanted to still study our culture. And of course, we are now related to the um, younger Nara people, um, in the, which is the traditional owners of Uru. Uh, and we go back every two years and to go out with the men and to study younger Nara culture and put them down. So we never, we didn't adapt to our ceremony stopping because uh, and it was part of the missionaries that really pressured our people. And today we got to sit in a dump of waste from all over the world. Why South Australia? Why our country? Yeah, he's a very, very sad, sentimental chap, you know. Aborigines, and uh, in the you, you have to, you know, you rap in that it. Yeah, you know, it's sad. Hmm. And that's what, uh, you know, other people do. Um, you have to, you know, you know, 
while a while up and uh, turn it upside down, inside out, and uh, root the apple and that acre, eat the apple and wood glue apple and that acre. Noise pollution. You get dynamites and things going off, explosives and things. Machines drilling holes here and there. And that's why we don't have any animals. <laughs> you might see one or two, but not like it used to be. Yeah. This is all about money. This is not about what we believe in our heritage. We're the oldest living culture on the planet. I've talked about cultural genocide on many occasions. You know, and I and I explain what cultural genocide is, and I explain it in a way that cultural genocide. You're looking at it. Tordo Sanbi has suffered cultural genocide. I don't do my song. I don't do my dance. I'm I'm not an initiated man. I should be. I'm 67 years old, and I should be telling my stories to my children about being initiated and why it's important. This is what cultural genocide is, and I explain that to my community and to the non-Aboriginal population. And I talk about genocide, the genocidal act that has occurred in Australia for hundreds and thousands of Aboriginal people. My name's Bruce Hammond. I'm a descendant of the Tangani people with connections uh, to the Western Aranda people, Central Australia, through my grandmother, and Tangani, lower southeast of South Australia, through my grandfather. Um, our family's been involved in the discussions around how pe Aboriginal people have been treated for 60 or 80 years. My mother's life was setting up the Aranungal Pitinjar Yonkinjara Land Rights Act, the hand back to Uluru. And we grew up around the dinner table talking about this stuff regularly. We've come full circle in the business of Aboriginal affairs in Australia, where we now agree that the removal of country was a key element of dispossession. This to me is another element of removal of country. I have the birthright authority to raise my voice around this topic because of my ancestral connections to country. Yet I can't be heard in all of the so-called political elements now that are involved. There's a whole department that's funded. There's a whole road gang traveling the country, bringing food and free food and the trinkets and berries of things gone past to create an interest level around the discussion that basically is about, again, the removal of country. This element of the nuclear waste dump is but one piece of that. This national waste storage discussion came to our table back in 1998 um, and my grandmother and, a, and these amazing Gubaridi Gungayurta women were instrumental in fighting that campaign um, in the Erarewandi campaign and were successful. After many years though it took, took some time to really talk and talk strong and talk straight out to the Howard government back then but they were successful, um, but years down, it has now come back around a whole 360 to South Australia where we have to sit down and have this fight or this discussion again. And as we know, it'll never go away if we allow this to happen because it'll be the, uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back, the thin edge of the wedge. Once it's here, it's already there. So what are you complaining about? We need to be loud around this now to say that there are a lot of people here who do not want the world's waste in our backyards. And especially around the really important sacred places in Central Australia where the water tables are. And especially around these places where our cultural practice has been so adversely affected by previous legislation, yet here we go again. I don't see it much dis different to the removal of language, children and country. And the same authority was used then that they had the lack of authority. It's just taken them 200 years to figure out that they'd wronged it. In 200 years time, are we gonna be sitting around the table, our kids, 
and our grandchildren saying they got it wrong, just like that we did the first time with Aboriginal people and the First Nations people of the world. We're not going to sit quiet on this now. We are educated. We do listen. We do connect and we do share our information together. And that's important to understand. They got away with it the first time because they could divide and rule. They could split us up. They could move us around. They created legislation so that we couldn't speak language. They removed our children so that we couldn't educate our children about how to act on country and how to be appropriate around country. So from a historical perspective, this is the same as what's happened in the past. It's just a different topic. It's the same lack of authority being overused and, and being steamrolled over us to say, you must comply. You must comply to this discussion. There's no investment in the alternative solution, which is not to generate this rubbish in the first place and to create a society that has a longer picture of the, view, the world than a 10 or 20 year cycle. And uranium today uh, is, is a big thing. Uh, people want to use it uh, for warmth in other country, uh, technology in medicine, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, we don't have to have that. And uranium sometimes I think uh, destroys people's lives, especially in, uh, in war, uh, when they use, make bombs out of it. Maybe they should, like I said, they should keep it in their home place. It's because like, uh, when we go to buy things from the shop, uh, we, we, we responsible, we've got to be responsible for our own uh, littering. Yeah? So what we do, we take it to a dump. But that dump's legal. Right? But if they just bring things back and just want to dump it on people without any uh, um, um, notification or try to talk to the people, uh, then uh, really I find those people are very, very rude because uh, they're not supposed to come to interfere with other people's land because we don't do it. And I reckon uranium, if, they, if it's causing too much of a problem, they should just leave it where it is. Forget it. Go home. And if you're cold in your country, by all means, suffer with it because there's no way we can help you people. You know, because you know uh, we don't have to have these things in place. Because how, how we lived before, you know, we only just had a fire, and we were very happy, you know. And we had our land, we had our animals with us, you know. And now you got these other things coming in, uh, that just takes everything away and leaves us so sad. The Atyamutna community are currently faced with the pressures of the federal government wanting a national waste storage facility. Um, so that location has been identified. My name is Regina McKenzie. Um, I'm part of the Viliwano Eurus. Um, here in the Atyamutna groups we made up of different, four different groups. I identify with Guyani and Wanpu Yurina within Atyamutna, the four groups. The reason I um, love this area is that I grew, I've always come up here with my dad and I was up here with my sister and, you know, I've, I've got a really close connection with, with the Wallabadina area. Um, it's a very significant site for women, our two needs of seven sisters are there. So is, um, so is the Willy Wagtail story. Also the emu and the um, curlew stories. Then you also got our, our law story, which is Weevil um, Mogadavid that goes through there. And same as um, this is an area that um, Yulu walks through, which is the kingfisher. When he's chasing the Akurus down from south in the Goyani way. Um, this area is a, also a, a place of trade. It's actually a, ma a main trade route from people coming up from the south ways to going up to Vukutu, um, Oka Mines. And um, it's something that's really, really important. Like it's a high density of archaeology out in the area shows how important this place was in the past. 
of the Aboriginal people. And the thing is, is that we still occupy the land. Under occupation, we still go out there, we still hunt and gather, and we still do, all our children learn to swim out there. Um, every summer, we don't go into town to the pool, we go out to Auckland to swim. And um, there's, we still practice our bush medicines, we still practice our, our bush tuckers, we even still practice our languages and songs and dance to the area. And we're actually at the moment, they've got a, um, a proposed site for a nuclear waste dump. They say it's low level, but it's also intermediate. It's all going to be stored above ground. Um, this is also the intermediate waste. The area that we that they, they've picked, um, in a 1955, 56 flood, all that area was underwater. So if there's another, if, there, if there's ever another flood, that's the same as this last flood, it will affect um, what they're trying to build. But other than that, it's affecting our, our, our culture stories, our storylines. Our country, our Yarate, it goes up to that, around that area in the Flinders Ranges as well. We're actually very close neighbours with the Adnumatna people, so we will always stand in solidarity with the Adnumatna people. Uh, if they don't want that nuclear waste in their part of the country, we don't want it in our country either. There will be, most probably be traditional practices that have been held on that, on that ground, you know, burial sites, you know, birthing sites for, for the women, and, and, and meeting places. And these are the concerns that we're having. This is, that, this is the lack of respect that is being given to us as traditional owners. We're losing this on a daily basis. The total thing is about let's establish a mine, let's put in a dump something and where well, this waste does not belong to us so why should it be given to us the first and most strong point for me is um, the wildlife because out here we do a lot of hunting to survive because um, we like our fresh meat um, it can affect the water under the ground um, and if that happens like all throughout the country will be affected because the Creeks and rivers are interconnected. So yeah, the uh, about water here, yeah? like um, the mining companies, you know, they use the water too much. You know, this these trees are gonna die, yeah, and these rocks will start to collapse because there's nothing there to keep them stable, and. Uh, Water is always is one of the most important things to everything. Yeah. Plants, animals, us. But then, you know, when they start to mine things, they have to have lots and lots of water to, uh, to, uh, to get whatever they want out of the ground. And plus, that's the reason why, you know, like, when you see a piece of land die, uh, it doesn't matter where you is, uh, because I take water from here, but you will see something horrible is happening at the back. It doesn't matter, uh, because they have sucked the water all the way from the top down, and uh, that leaves then the water, uh, the uh, the water tables dry, uh, and everything then falls to bits. The water table and the underground water is extremely important. It's our chukupa, it's our storyline. It's never discussed in natural resource management terms because it's always given away at high value to organisations mining companies, construction, um, that groundwater, the water in the Lake Hare Basin and the Great Artesian Basin is paramount to survival for desert Aboriginal people of which I'm ancestrally connected. They deliberately don't talk about groundwater for just that reason because it's so controversial and Aboriginal people have a right, a birthright to discuss how that's used and how it's maintained. And if you think about it, the ground springs in Western Desert and Central Australia 
were our survival points for water and also our cultural practice sites and generally all arrays around granite country which is exactly the same country they're looking to bury nuclear waste in. It also lends itself to the fracking debate because it breaks the crust of the earth around the granite countries that have never been designed for, to be broken into. They're there for a reason. We don't have to understand the reason. We know that the practice around those points is very significant. Now, mainstream natural resource management call that folklore. And many things have been called folklore that have been reality or misunderstood. The storyline is, a lot of people call them songlines. With us, when we've got the storylines, you've got specific places where you sing. And that's, the, that's where the song lines come in. And um, the area where this waste dump is, is the part where you sing about, about healing and about grief. That's, this area is very significant to our family. And um, it also takes in the, the song and the story of the Artenis, how, how they got up into the sky and stuff. The storyline goes across the lake to other areas. This is what the government doesn't understand. It doesn't understand our, impact, our belief systems. And what's really annoying is that the Indigenous, the Indigenous Charter that they've done to the United Nations, they actually signed off. Um, the Article 29.2 of it states they can't put waste in the area without first consulting the Aboriginal people, which didn't happen. And whether it be the whether it be the low low intermediate waste or the high high level waste, what not everything people got to understand is that it's going to impact Aboriginal people on a deeper level, on a spiritual and a and our belief system is going to be under attack. Our strength comes from the ability to manage, maintain and inhibit negative impacts and live on country. Over the life of some of this stuff is going to be long than Aboriginal people occupied this continent. Long than any man. We say that we've got the oldest living culture in the world, Aboriginal people. We've got evidence of that. But this stuff is here, you know, if people can look at 80,000 years, 100,000 years of human occupancy of this, of Earth, Mother Earth, you know, this stuff is going to be around for at least 100,000 or more. And we life, you know, our, our, our set going to be guaranteed to, to be safe. Not only our younger generation, but us younger generation are also trying to look after our older generation. And um, we won't be able to do that if our lands are poisoned. Uh, we have stories here. And, uh, and they say Aka ruler came about, got its name, Akura, which is the big serpent. And it will always stand here today. Uh, there are stories for Aka ruler and Uranium. Yeah, you know what, you have to wonder. Yeah. One of the most beautiful country, Akarula. There are lots and lots of stories, uh, you know, and we all know that this country is very, very old. Our people tell us these mountains were, you know, quite high, not what like they used to be. Uh, but now they're disappearing, and uh, and then you know, wooden weapon yana ka yana nga, wala wala panda, and then yeah, they would need. We want to keep looking at these mountains, and that's one of the reasons we got Igor as a cultural uh, centre where we can teach Adamantna culture that whatever happens in this state uh, or in this country, we're going to be still heroes, you know, Aboriginal people, and the land is going to still mean a lot to us. Uh, and of course, you know, Giles Ham and I, we discovered a, 
uh, emu, which is in the northern Flinders Ranges, and uh, we get a coming down of 49,000 years, so you could say 50,000 years of a machine that was made by a white man. So we are proud of that, and uh, the, you know, archaeology is one of the things that are most famous in this country because that's only the one that can get evidence of how long the Australian Aborigine lived in this country. Yeah. So, you know, what sort of game are we playing? Uh, I've been throughout the... I went to south of France in 1982 to study rock art and conservation. I uh, also started here in 1977 in terms of caring for Aboriginal sites. Um, and we recorded heaps of Aboriginal sites here. And they're supposed to be now responsible for the South Australian Government to protect those sites under the Australian Government. And, uh, you know, I think they're still short, short changing us. Um, and uh, they don't think that Aboriginal sites is important there. But we do think because we're the first Australians and um, we love this country and all Australian Aborigines should be proud that we got a country that we can still protect uh, and we got a country that we got to tell the white man that we were here first. It was a, a big serpent that used to live here which we call the Hokora. Now the Hokora they used to live here, up in the Yaki water rolls in the Gammon Ranges. And uh, he used to go down uh, to the lake and uh, drink the water, the sea water. But then one day he drank so much, he grew so big, huge. And uh, when, then when he came, started to move back to his home, uh, where he used to live in the Gammon Ranges, Yaki, uh, because of the land was still soft back then, and uh, as he travelled, he carved out the creeks, uh, the Harkarula Creek, and plus, as he travelled along, he pushed things to one side, and that's what created these uh, mountains, as you can see how he's, uh, they've been travelling along. But then, uh, up near Mount Painter. Um, that's where the uh, okra, he felt sick because of all the saline from the seawater made him sick and uh, he vomited. He vomited and vomited so much that he left a big pile of slime which created uranium. And today uh, people come to mine uranium uh, and this is a very hot country and uh, because of the, uh, the uh, acids and stuff that came from the, the inner side of the, uh, the big serpent. And, uh, and we sort of feel guilty a little bit by allowing these things to go away from our country because my people, uh, they knew uranium was quite a very, very dangerous even before the Western man came here to tell us what it's all about. We already knew that. On your visit there, you just take good note. You can feel sometimes the ground moving from under, under, you, under your feet. It's because that ground is still moving. You can hear the rumble. We call that the rumbling of the Alcora. Alcora is a serpent. Sometimes he gets disturbed and he moves around and then the earth moves. There's nothing powerful, more powerful than the okra. Man cannot construct anything that can stop the okra. <laughs>